Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the ongoing Remarkable Series, The Adventures of Dr. Douglas Gabriel. And uh, I say adventures because it really was an adventure, and I was fortunate enough to be part and parcel of certain episodes of this adventure. But today we're going to venture off into some somewhat unexplored territory because Douglas has told me he's actually going to come forth with stories that even I don't know. So this should prove to be a good one. We're, we're going to the islands and we're going to explore his history over in Hawaii and his super sensible relationship with Pele. Mm. And my name is John Barnwell, and I'm here in the greater Detroit area with Dr. Gabriel. And without further ado, how are you, Douglas? I'm good. And you just should have listened to me when I was talking to you on the phone from Hawaii saying, come and visit, John. Brian <laughs> came, uh, Ralph came, Rick came, uh, Tynan came. All these people came and visited because I became a tour guide, basically, when I got there. But let's finish up and also... I always have to consider that some people may be seeing this and never have seen any of the others. So I try to, you know, weave it together so that it, you know, you can at least see where we came from, where we're going. <clears throat> so essentially, uh, I would like to say that people have been commenting, calling, writing, messaging, and telling me that what we did in the last few talks on Waldorf and uh, in one of them, I wrote an article where I divorced myself from the Association of Waldorf Schools in North America. And people are saying that's just a, such an incredibly courageous and wonderful thing to do. And this is what we have to do, stand up to this, um, you know, the ESG, the diversity, equity and inclusion and the ESG and all this stuff. Uh, well, I did it simply because when it came to my attention right before we did those shows, I couldn't help not doing it. And do they care whether I divorce myself from them? They don't care about me. They haven't cared about uh, anybody in anthroposophy for about a decade. You know, I, as I've said before, I raised so much money for the Rudolf Steiner College out there. And then now it's it's bankrupt. It doesn't even work. It's dead. Uh, a lot of these places uh, have gone online. And who's teaching the courses online? Ex-students of mine who literally trained with me and no one else because they didn't have a training. They didn't go to a proper training institute. I trained a lot of teachers in the public domain and also when I was in Hawaii. As a matter of fact, when I got there, um, my friend, I'm going to change a few names here because I have to refer to this person a lot. I'm going to call him Gary. So my friend Gary, who I'd gone through school with in Detroit, uh, he was there for two years. He was like my best bud there in the institute, and he moved off to Hawaii. So a few years later, I visited him. That was my first visit, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then my good friend, your good friend, Ariel, and her husband, Aravinda, they lived in Hawaii for a while, and I went to visit them once. So that's how I kept saying, why I kept saying, I'm going to teach my class first through eighth grade, and then I'm going to Hawaii. You don't have to give me a sabbatical because I'm just not coming back. <laughs> I'm never coming back to Detroit. And why? Because I'd already been told by Werner as soon as I finished my eight years, that I could come be the head of Sunbridge College, which had moved from Detroit, which was called the Waldorf Institute when it was out in Detroit and then in Southfield near Detroit. And then um, some people convinced him when he found out he was um, very sick to move to Sunbridge, which I mean, to move the college, which had an inner name. Its name was always Sunbridge College. Werner gave it that name, but he never used the name. He called it the Waldorf Institute. So he moved to the number one place for anthroposophy in America, Spring Valley, New York, Hungry Hollow, to the Threefold Farm, and they started there, the Sunbridge College. And it still goes on today, but again, I just got messages from people saying that these the teacher training institutes don't even have any anthroposophists in them. So the people training the Waldorf teachers are not anthroposophists. So I looked it up, and you know, just a couple of days ago, I'm going, holy Lord, these are, these are some of the worst people they could possibly have teaching in some of these places. Anyway, doesn't matter. The point is, 
What we were saying is more than true, and I had, I had held out some hope that maybe it hadn't reached Europe and other places and other countries, but I was wrong. I'm getting messages from all over the world saying, you have nailed it. That's exactly what's going on. Rudolf Steiner's been taking out, taken out of Waldorf schools, and they fire the most experienced teachers and anthroposophists. And so that jumps back to the story where we left it off after taking this class in Detroit and just um, working in a building that had, a, it was haunted, literally. And there were real problems with the school even before I ever got there. Uh, at the end of fifth grade, when Ralph was graduating his eighth grade and I was his sponsor teacher, and so I was very much part of this eighth grade graduation. After the graduation, I walked into the bathroom and one of these three people running the school walked in and handed me a letter. And he looked like he was going to pass out. And I said, oh, Lordy. And then I told him what was in the letter before I opened it. And then I grabbed it out of his hand and ripped it into pieces and threw it in the toilet. <laughs> and said, you could, you could attempt to do this, but mark my words. If you fire me, and, and in it, there was a clause, and I knew this, that I, if I didn't turn in my keys right then, I wouldn't get my summer pay. And we were going out on three months of summer, and that's when I, I lived off my summer pay. And so uh, I had it in my keys. I said, this is what you want. You can have the keys, but mark my words, you'll lose half your teachers, and you'll lose half the students if you do this. And that's the only time I ever responded to being fired. Uh, and so the board ordered them three times and wrote letters saying, rehire him. I waited all summer long. Half the teachers the next day during the meetings quit. 18 teachers quit. They said, if he's not here, we're not here. And by, I waited all summer long, meditating, fasting, praying, thinking that they would hire me back and everything would be fine. So I stayed in my little temple room where I lived, which used to be the um, the church for the Quakers. It was the Quaker meeting house. <laughs> the place was beautiful energy. And I stayed in there all summer. Didn't speak to anybody because uh, I knew that whatever I said was going to be used against me in a bad way. And I was just waiting to find out because they fired me with cause. Cause? What was the cause? <laughs> really? There was a cause? So to this day, there's no cause ever been brought forward, but the rumors have accused me of every heinous crime on the face of the earth for whatever. That's why I was fired, but they never gave a reason. So Robert Thibodeau said to me, because I immediately started getting offers because the people hurt in the movement heard I was fired. So they, well, I was getting offers from all over the place, but Robert Thibodeau made me the ultimate offer. He said, you come work for me. And I'm gonna we're gonna open uh, Wizard's New Age video. You're gonna be the manager. You can be the manager of the Ohm Vegetarian Macrobiotic Restaurant and help Colleen, his wife. And you can manage the Mayflower. You'll be the outer manager, and I'll be in the back. And I'm not gonna do readings. You you can handle all the readings. You can handle everything out front. I'm taking a break, but I'll be in the back having fun, writing music, writing poems. So I worked for him for a year, and we went everywhere. We went to Jamaica. I went to Jamaica a couple times. We went to the Sequoia Forest. We went to every international astrology conference that year that there was. We went to everything. And we had so much fun. We also went swimming every day that we could out in Alderman Lake and had a great time. And that was the 12th year I was in Detroit. And Kathleen Kennedy, as you know, came to see me there at the Mayflower because I was no longer hiding what I was doing with her for 12 years, which was advising her and helping her write the um, uh, the treatments for the different movies that she was involved in. And so everything kind of, uh, Lynn Andrews came, all kinds of these amazing people came in that year. Uh, Bob, I made Bob <laughs> into the hero of the Harmonic Convergence. So he was on national television. He was on Good Morning America. He was on uh, Sally Jesse Raphael. He was on all these shows. He was constantly, it was the most fun year. I think I ever had my whole life. And we sold crystals like crazy. And, and I, I was selling thousands of books to Kathleen Kennedy to put in that library, the Skywalker Library, which you'll still today see the Mayflower stamp on almost all those books. So I had a great time and I made so much money that I said to myself, 
okay, when you get $50,000 in cash, you're going to book a ticket around the world and you're going to go on a trip. And they had this cool thing that they just come out with. You buy one ticket for one price and you can stop as many places as you want in a year, as long as they keep going in the same direction you started until you come back to where you began. And it was only like $10,000 ticket. It was like, okay, that's crazy. It was some gimmick or whatever, but I bought, I bought one of those, but I didn't designate, I didn't start it and I didn't designate it until I had traveled around America and gone to all these different places. And that's when I met Russell Targ's group there, you know, and got to sit in Russell Targ's chair and help them decide about the Sacramento Waldorf School. I mean, well, I, I went there too, but the Santa Cruz Waldorf School helped found that year. The San Diego Waldorf School helped the Vancouver Waldorf School move uh, my the, the man, the money behind that school who was a dear friend. So I knew all these people because I was a business manager and I knew all the schools. So everywhere I went, I could stay in my van at the Waldorf School and they all offered me jobs. And, every, and I was like the hero. They were all getting money from grants I wrote. So every place I went, I was treated like a hero, except, what do they say? A, a prophet is not known in his own town. Yeah, well, the three people who fired me in Detroit, you know, still to this day can't say why they fired me, but they, they launched me on a path that was amazing from then on. Yeah, uh, a flurry of activity and meeting all kinds of fascinating people. You, you mentioned in passing uh, Russell Tark. Uh, we mentioned him before, but I'm sure there's people watching this that haven't seen that episode. And so I'll just let you know that Russell Targ is the really father of what's called remote viewing. That's where the, it's a, it was a government program where they would get a psychic a clairvoyant people and use them to be able to view things at a distance. And he was at the Stanford Research Institute. This started way back in 1972 with Harold Putoff. And uh, that was a part of the US Defense Intelligence Agency Stargate project. So that's just, you know, when he drops these names, you know, he, you shouldn't assume that everybody knows what that means. Yeah, that's for sure. I didn't know who he was. Matter of fact, when they said, well, you know, you're sitting in Russell Targ's chair, and I'm going, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what's that mean? They were hiring me to determine whether the school they wanted to buy that was on the San Andreas Fault, but it had redwoods on it and two lakes and the most beautiful property and land and building ever. It's just so gorgeous. And I'm looking out there at the San Andreas Fault. And I'm saying, well, here's the deal. It's not, that's not going to go off. Not why, no, that's not in any near time is that going to go off. But you don't want this place because I got a clairvoyant impression that there was some um, fraudulent dealings with it. So they backed off of that place and we found another place. But the point is, is that I traveled all around. Now as a free agent, right? And I have this ticket in my pocket to go around the world. And this ticket was strange. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I traveled all up and down the coast and visited all kinds of places that I had, you know, like I said the other day, I went to uh, Paramahasa Yogananda's place where he's buried and he's in a glass casket and it's open air. It, there's big gaps on it and he smells like the most fragrant blossoms you've ever smelled in your whole life. And I have to uh, uh, make a correction for last week because I said that Paramahansa Yogananda thought he was Alexander the Great, which was like, you know, I got a glitch on that one. He, he thought he was William the Conqueror, which is pretty fascinating considering his, his uh, significant relationship to the English-speaking world because most people don't know that, but almost all of the teachers of, of the yogic tradition that came to America were of the Shivite tradition, which Rudolf Steiner very clearly indicates that Shiva is basically the unredeemed Lucifer. Just so you know that. And Yogananda was, was a Vishnuvite. So that ties back to the tradition of Krishna and the battle of Kurukshetra. And in fact, Yogananda believed himself to be Arjuna, who was the charioteer riding with Krishna in the battle of Kurukshetra. And given that 
Uh, Yogananda hasn't decayed to this day since he died back way back in the, what was that like 89 or something like that you know it's a, no 79 excuse me yeah and so uh, well maybe he's right yeah he was a beautiful person from uh, what I could tell I never got to meet him but I use this time now to kind of I even went to the East Coast and then went all the way. I'm driving around, going to the West Coast and going to all these schools. And as I'm going along, what am I finding out? Oh, my best friend at the Denver school got fired. Same exact lady from Osna came and told them to fire him. Same way they fired me after the last day of school with no warning, with a threat that if he ever said one word, he wouldn't get his summer pay. And then I went to the Cheyenne school in Wyoming. And oh, one of my other dearest friends had been fired in the exact same manner. So here I am traveling around to Waldorf schools, kind of, you know, wondering whether I should, you know, I had missed something and maybe one of these schools would be better than going to where I was planning to head. But anyway, I checked it all out. No, it wasn't. So then I sold my van and I'm headed to Hawaii. I get my ticket, but my call my friend Gary up. And Gary's living on the big island of Hawaii. And he goes, no, 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 you can't. You can't go on a world tour. You're coming here and you're going to take over the Malama Lama Waldorf School. And I'm going, never heard of it. Where is that? It's on the Big Island. I said, there's no Waldorf School in the Big Island, Gary. He goes, yes, there is. I said, no, there's not. I know all the Waldorf schools, even the little thing. No, there's no, no. They None of them are trained, Doug. And it's in a beautiful place called Hawaiian Paradise Park. And I promise you, when you come here, you will not go on your world trip. And I'm like, okay, okay, you've convinced me. I won't start my world trip tour until I come there and take a look at this school. But Gary, I'm coming to go to Kahumana. I want to live at Kahumana and on the on Oahu, um, not in the city of Honolulu on the on the west side uh, in Waimea. Beautiful where the road ends. There's this beautiful community that Gary had lived in, and I had visited him there. And it was the best community, and it's in Hawaii. You could walk to the beach. They had a sailboat as part of their community. It was um, Francis Sidow, Dr. Francis Sidow, who was, a, I had known her before I ever went there, but Gary was living there. And the reason that I made sure to go there, not just because of Dr. Sidow, and uh, who founded this community for uh there isn't really a name for these kind of people. They're adults who were special ed kind of students who never will ever recover. And they may be psychological or it could be mental, could be physical. So, but this place was where the richest people in the whole, well, basically the whole world, not just anthroposophists, sent their children who had these severe problems to live out their life in this beautiful place. It's literally as beautiful as anything you'll ever see. And it had a big, gigantic biodynamic garden that um, Hugh Courtney and others helped work on, myself, uh, all kinds of biodynamic people helped on this place. And my friend, Gary, was in the University of Hawaii getting his degree in agriculture, so he lived in this community. Now, what made the community really special was not only that they had a, uh, a retired eurythmist living there, and all these anthroposophists, and they did beautiful plays and music and celebrations and festivals, and they ate biodynamic food all the time, and they were helping um, um, single mothers who had children. They built a little community for them. Beautiful place, but Werner had told me that the only person he'd met ever, like me, and I'm going to say this guy's name, but he's still alive, and the reason I'm going to say it is some months ago, he called me, left a message, and I know it was him because you, you can't he you can't mistake this guy. And he left a message saying, "Oh my gosh, I just ran across you on the internet, and blah blah. Let's talk." So I tried to reach him, couldn't. He's still alive. His name is Father Phil. And my dear friend Anastasi had gone there to study with him because he's a Greek Orthodox, kind of a special type of Greek Orthodox, and they had built him a beautiful church, and he had this ministry there. An incredible ministry because these people were really helping people. You talk about service. They provided services no one else provides. So anyway, I met this guy. Now, Werner had said that he went out of his way to go visit this man uh, uh, to ask him questions about the Institute 
And I'm going, well, Douglas, the rumor is he talks with angels. You know this, right, John? You know all about Father Phil. So Werner went there and came back, and he was very impressed with this guy. He says, Douglas, I'm telling you, he's just like you. I ask him a question. He goes into some strange condition. You can see him communicating with somebody, and then he comes back and calmly tells you what he, what they told him, like it's nothing. It's like the look on uh, Werner Glass's face when he was in the living room with David Spangler and a, and a group of us. <laughs> The look on his face when he realized that David Spangler was a, another one like Father Phil, who would just all of a sudden translate into a different state of consciousness and start speaking from higher levels of consciousness. And so these things to us are, are very real. And you can you can look askance at us or what, what have you, but uh, it's quite remarkable. I remember we had a conference and... and uh, we brought in some of the people from Findhorn and Dorothy McLean was giving her little talk and there were three whirlwinds outside the window next to her for the duration of her talk, making the wind whistle away. And as soon as she finished, they laughed. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned her. I brought her to Hawaii and she had never been there before. And she had such an experience with the elemental beings. I took her around and, and I'd say, what do you see here? And she'd see the same things I saw. So yes, David Spangler, Dorothy McLean, a few others could just, she'd go talk to the elementals. She didn't talk to angels, but she just, boom, just, oh, just like Rosina Ard or jo, uh, Josephine Porter, some of my other teachers, they could talk to the elemental kingdom. And I mean, really talk with them. And they're very clever. Matter of fact, Steiner even sometimes says they're wise, but they're more clever than they are wise because they're going to trick you sometimes because they love to get you to dance for them and then move through you and do things for them. Anyway, so I met Father Phil and we became fast friends. And um, I wanted to go back and live in that community with them. So that's where I was headed when I'd said, I'm going to do my eight years and I'm going to Hawaii. I wasn't going to Hawaii to do Waldorf, even though I was going to, they had a little Waldorf school there on the property. And I was going to do curative work with, you know, adults and children and stuff like that and do biodynamics and just basically retire for the rest of my life. Because as you know, uh, throughout my life, I've been told I have different terminal illnesses. Well, none of them have killed me yet, but I, at that point, actually kind of believe some of these stories. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go there and live my final days out in beautiful paradise. And it was paradise. And while I was there, I, I met some very interesting people uh, who one of them gave us a sailboat, a big, big ocean going sailboat. Just loved me so much. They just gave it to me. So I gave it to the community. I couldn't sail and I, I wasn't going to go out in the ocean sailing. That's like to me crazy. But anyway, so that's where I was headed. And so uh, uh, Gary says, no, you got to come to the big island. Now, I'd been to Maui and Maui was beautiful. And I'd been to Oahu, but I didn't really like Oahu that much because Honolulu is a big city on a little island with the traffic jams every day at five o'clock. It's disgusting. I mean, there's places there, you know, the North Shore, Waimea, uh, Wailua Valley, Waimea. There's uh, Hanama Bay, some incredibly beautiful places, but in general, just too many people. So I wasn't, you know, that's where I was kind of headed. But Gary said, no, 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 no. We'll, I'll take you back over. We'll go back over to Kahomani. You'll see that it's not the same as it used to be. And you're going to stay here. I know you're going to stay here. Well, he was a very dear friend of mine. So I flew to Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, a straight flight to the big island, got off the plane. And it was raining worse than any rain I'd ever seen in my entire life. So hard that it would practically knock you to the ground. Now, this is Hilo, Hawaii. It's got the rainy side of Hawaii, and it's the rainiest city in America and the second rainiest, rainiest place in America. The first is in Kauai. It rains every single day there for hours in this one little valley. But this place, you know, it rains a lot. And matter of fact, they say if you're not going to if you can't do it in the rain, you can't do it in Hilo, Hilo, Hawaii. And no one ever carried umbrellas. They always just wore swim trunks. <laughs> flops and an, and an aloha shirt literally no one carried wallets they didn't carry nothing why because they were going to get drenched anyway 
So I arrive and my friend Gary's there and, you know, and, and I say, what's going on here? This, what's this ring? He goes, it's unbelievable. This just started today. I went, really? And uh, I said, but does it rain hard like this? He goes, well, I've never seen it rain this hard before. So we went back to his place and that's where I was going to stay for a while. And it just kept raining. So I couldn't rent a car. So I, I rented and later bought a motorcycle because at the same time, the Ironman competition was going on over on the Gold Coast where it almost never rains. And, uh, you know, the Ironman competition, they had bought up all the cars and everything. And so I was on the other side. So we did go over there to visit that. Very interesting. But the point is, is that for two solid weeks, nonstop, day and night, not one single minute did it stop raining. The hardest rain that they had ever had in the Big Island's history. Not only that, it started lightning after a few days. And then the lightning would come every three to four seconds. And this continued day and night for days and days. It scared the Hawaiian people out of their mind. They thought the end had come. They had never even seen lightning, okay? There was no lightning in their history. But now there's more lightning and it's just scared the snot out of everybody. Well, they hadn't met you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the God was trying to send those bolts at me. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm out there. I'm, you know, like a good Hawaiian. They call him Kama Aina, child of the island. I'm in my flip-flops, my Aloha shirt, and uh, my swim trunks for two weeks riding around on a motorcycle going to these amazing places that I'm going to tell you about now. But uh, that was just the kind of elemental force that happened on the Big Island. It was so intense that people don't understand. They, they call it, uh, you know, another day in paradise. No, it's not. Not in Hilo, where it rains like insanely, and the volcano has been going off. It had been going off for uh, basically continuously for about a year, two, a year or two before I got there. It started going off, and it was going off continuously and flowing into the ocean, and or, you know, it was flowing from this place called Pu'u'o'o. It, which is a part of um, Mauna Loa. Now, let me describe this island for you. Okay, it's, it's uh, if you take all the other Hawaiian islands, all of them, combine them, put them in the big island, it's only half of the big island. It's 36 miles around the edge of it, but it will take you <laughs> hours to make the drive because the road is insane. Uh, but you can go all the way around the island. But uh, in the middle of the island are two big mountains. One is a cone mountain called Mauna Kea, and the other one is called Mauna Loa, which is a shield volcano, or, and the other one's a cone volcano mountain. Mauna Kea is the largest mountain in the world. Now you're going to say, you're out of your mind. It's only 15,000 feet tall. No, follow it to the base in the ocean, and it's larger than Mount Everest, taller than Mount Everest. It's the largest mountain in the world. And mind you, the Hawaiian Islands are over a place uh, where magma comes shooting up out of the ocean floor and it goes up and creates one mm -hmm. island and then the earth shifts and it goes and creates the next island and the earth shifts and creates the next. And and the big island is the biggest, but now it's that's not where the volcano is um, putting out the most magma. There is another island being formed under the water offshore of the big island. And so Pele is the goddess of the volcano. And there, literally, you come to worship Pele. And if you don't worship her, she will kill you. And I'm not exaggerating, okay? I, 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 while I was there, usually between two to four people a week die in the Big Island of Hawaii. And they never report it anywhere because they don't want to stop tourism. So when I first got there, uh, one of the first places um, my friend Gary took me was a place called Boiling Pots. Now, he didn't tell me the whole story then, but because he he was he knew I was clairvoyant and he was messing with me uh, and he was also gay. And for the two years I knew him in Detroit, I didn't know he was gay. He was my best friend. I had no idea. So I get to Hawaii and he tells me, I think I should tell you this. I have HIV. And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't even, it didn't even, I, I mean, I had been in that group that studied HIV and the whole, it didn't even phase me. It didn't even enter my mind. Like a few days later, I turned and went, does that mean you're gay? <laughs> he goes, yeah. 
I'm gay. I'm like, okay, now you're blowing my mind, all right? There's, uh, okay, fine. Well, he introduced me. The Big Island is home to the per capita to more millionaires than anywhere else on the, on the face of the earth at that time. And 75% of them were gay. And they owned all the best places. They owned the best restaurants. They owned, they owned this place called Kalani Hanua, where everyone came to do retreats from um, Ken Wilbur to you know Zen masters to uh, everybody. And so I'd hang out there a lot and meet all these people, and it was very cool. But on all the, on all the best restaurants, all the best, all the richest things in on the Big Island of Hawaii. All those people were Glenn's friends, the, the, the major people in the arts department at the university, the da, 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 all down through. So I got to immediately meet the coolest people on the Big Island. But he takes me to this place, which is right next to Hilo. We just, here's Hilo. You go up what's called the Saddle Road or the road going up to go in between these two big mountains called the Saddle Road between one side and the other. You can't take it, go up there unless you have got a great vehicle, and you will kill your vehicle if you attempt to go up those mountains and come down. I know I killed a number of vehicles while I was there doing these things. <clears throat> so we go up to boiling pots and he doesn't tell me that this is the initiation site for young Hawaiians and that hundreds of them have died there failing in the test of jumping in these waters and swimming over to the waterfall. <laughs> so he says to me, he brings me up there. There's signs, you know, I forget whether it's 500 or $5,000 fines, but you can't swim in this place. It's deadly. And it's one waterfall after the next, after the next, after the next. And each waterfall goes into this boiling pot and spins around. And so the current is very dynamic. It's a big, big waterfall, 40 foot tall, maybe taller waterfall. So he says, okay, what do you see here? And I said, I, I see danger. <laughs> what, do I, what do you mean, what do I see here? And he says, you see anything else? There's rumors that there's spirits and elementals here. And I said, you mean that 27 foot tall Naga serpent being right there underneath the waterfall. Is that what you're talking about? And he goes, yeah, that's what everybody sees. I, you see this thing? I said, how can you not see this thing? It's basically telling you, you jump in and I'm going to kill you. And so I'm like, okay, let's go. So I dive in, swim over to the waterfall and he follows behind me and he thinks, of course, I'm crazy, but I probably am. And I crawl up, I climb up the side of this waterfall. And when we get up to the top, here's this big ass waterfall coming over. And it's literally bored holes into the rock right there. So you have this hole like this. And I had psychically known that the initiation was to for the young Hawaiians, you had to climb up to the top of the waterfall, go through that hole, go through the hole, and then dive down. Right. And so that's what I did. But while I was up there, I noticed off to the side, there was this place where all the water was coming and there were like 20 waterfalls following inside of this kind of like a silo or a tube or something. You couldn't jump in it or I would have. And I found out later that I would have killed myself doing that because there was a lot of rocks down there. But once I dove down there, I was underwater and I look over here and here's a hole underwater that you could go in to go into this thing you know, big as, you know, four or five normal rooms and 20 waterfalls coming down. And it literally was the, one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced in my whole life. And it was literally, you couldn't, you could barely see that it, it, it was even there. You'd never notice it if you, unless you were up above doing this thing up on the waterfall. And so it became one of my favorite places because we did learn, we moved some rocks and logs around. We were able to jump down into this and I got other people to come there and I'd take them on the tour and we would defy the Naga, right? But, any, but if you go down to the other boiling pots and you stand right there, you could literally see these young Hawaiian boys jumping to their death. And literally, the story is hundreds and hundreds died there because the Hawaiians were fierce. They were so fierce that when I went to Kauai the first time, somebody told me, well, this is the place that you have to, uh, you can't, uh, this, is where, this is where the Hawaiians landed and where it's sacred to the ili'i, which are called the, the royalty of Hawaiians, called ili'i, you can't go there, Doug. Don't go there. Everybody goes there, has a bad experience. Don't go there. And I'm like, well, then I have to go there. Plus, I could see like beams of light coming up off of these places, some of them, because they would protect anything they thought was sacred by making human sacrifices. 
So this was a place with a cliff, big old cliff. And they literally, the story is that if you were caught there, they immediately just took you, threw you off the cliff. Only the elite could go there. And that's where the first Hawaiians did hula. And hula was taught by men. And it was a fierce dance that you did before war, before you went into battle. That's what hula is. It's been turned into some nicey nicies now. I studied it the whole time I was there. But the point is the real hula will scare the snot out of you because it's it looks like a battle, preparing for battle. So I go to this place. And I didn't know until later. And I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm seeing hundreds of Hawaiians thrown off this cliff to their death. And I'm thinking, what is this about? And I'm seeing, you know, in Hawaii, the elemental beings come up out of the earth because of the volcano. There's no earth really there. It's volcano. It's 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 magma that's turned into lava that's been turned into, you know, stuff grows out of it because it's the richest soil in the world. But there's really no soil there. So it all comes up. So you're in this atmosphere where there's no difference between you and the elemental kingdom. So you could see all of this stuff. I mean, it would happen, right? I didn't have to go into a, a sensitive state. It would come out and bite you in the face. It was just horrifying. And it's called kapu'u. It's called the curse of the dead. And so I was able to go to all the islands and just go around and go, uh-oh, right over there in that forest, uh, which is almost impassable, we're going in there. Why? Well, don't you see the big light coming off there? That's a that's a, hundreds of people probably were killed for that kapu'u. So we go there and we find these places. And pretty. this is what I did in the first year I was there. And and, Glit, and uh, Gary did the same thing uh, with me because he was adventurous. And uh, so we went to all these crazy places. But it's that's just in town. Boiling pots, that waterfall and, that, and the boiling pots was in Hilo. It wasn't even out of town. We didn't have to go on a hike. It, and there were literally, I lived there for almost seven years. Every single weekend, I went to some place that was more amazing than the last place. And in most cases, they were scarier, had more kapu'u curses on them. And no one goes there, especially the Hawaiians. Now, most people don't really know anything about Hawaiian history, but the, the current uh, leading Hawaiians there uh, came there quite a while ago. And there was another uh, group of Indians there that they totally eliminated. And so it, it has this kind of a, uh, darkness in its history that that is you know that again that type of history is far more common than, than people like to recall because people really don't know history since they've decided to become space beings and they don't have a relationship to time. But fortunately, Rudolf Steiner has pointed out that that the one of the uh, gifts of of the incarnation of Christ was that he gave us back time. And so we can help approach him through coming to a deeper understanding of the mysteries of time. That's so true. Now, the big island is all about space and time doesn't exist there. You can just see it. You can look all the way into the past. You can see uh, King Kamehameha sitting on his throne and the Heiau. I mean, it's just, it never goes away. It's imprinted into the ethers there so profoundly. And uh, the little people you're talking about are called Minahunis. They were at the Aboriginal people of Hawaii and they had special gifts beyond your imagination, beyond the Tahitian imagination who came there much later. Uh, the Tahitians followed the great white shark, and they followed all the way from uh, Tahitian islands to across the ocean, vast empty ocean, to the Hawaiian islands because they were told to go there and the great white shark led them. They followed them is what the story is. And who was it that led them? The person they called the great star teacher or just the star teacher. Uh, now the star teacher was a, was a Tahitian. I'll talk about him in a minute, but the Menahunis. Okay, there are a number of valleys, three valleys in the major Hawaiian islands, if you count Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, Lanai, Maui, and the big island, Hawaii. So when I say the big island, that's what they call it there. It's called Hawaii, the big island, the big island. And uh, essentially, uh, what you're looking for here is 
um, the evidence of the Menhunis can be found in the most wild valleys, which are now filled with feral pigs that have become boars with big tusks that will charge, kill you, and eat you. I'm not exaggerating. Many, many people, matter of fact, it used to be, they, they won't let any people go in this valley. They, call death, they sometimes call it Death Valley in Molokai. I went in there. And what did I find? So many boars that I was convinced that the people who got lost there, some of them very rich people, their, ch their children go there on a vacation and they go in this valley and they never come out. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence of the boars. And one time I'm in this, in this thing and I hear a boar rustling around. And when you see a boar, I was told, this is what you do. You, you find a tree you can climb up very quick, as quickly as you can. And the boar can't get up and eventually get away. So here's, I'm, I'm walking along this trail in Molokai alone again, which you should never do this alone. And by the way, most of the things I'm going to tell you, don't go to Hawaii and try this. Literally, you could kill yourself. So I'm hiking back here by myself. And this, and all of a sudden, I hear this rustle. And then a boar jumps, the, 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 the bush, the brush around me is probably five feet tall. The boar leaps up in the air like this. I'd heard of this flying pig, the flying boar. <laughs> and here's a big, here's a boar, big boar. I mean, like hundreds of pounds with tusks in the air looking at me. And it had jumped straight up and then came down and charged. Well, I immediately went up the tree and he's kept ramming into this tree. I'm telling you, that's the missing people. But on the big island, there's two of these. One's called... Um, YPO Valley, and the other one is called oh, uh, Alohu, uh, I forget the name of it. It's also called Death Valley. No one goes there unless you plan to hide from the police and live off of the produce that the people who live there planted that is still growing. I actually lived in YPO Valley for a while under a blue tarp in my flip-flops and my swimsuit, and, and the waterfall behind brought me my water. Every day I just went out and picked the fruit from the ground and lived there. And then I went deeper into that other valley, which no one does. It's insane to go there. And it was even more perfect and more pure. But there was, you know, uh, lots of feral pigs around. And you have to be careful because you can get giardia. Matter of fact, I ended up getting giardia from drinking water that was tainted. But the point is, in YPO Valley, there had been tsunamis twice that came in and wiped out the couple hundred people who live there. This place was so haunted. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And keep in mind, uh, tourists that go to Hawaii, they go, oh, how nice they make these trails to walk through the forest. And by the way, there's a reason they call it a rainforest. But those are not, those are not trails for tourists. Those are boar paths. <laughs> <laughs> That is true, John. Now, let me clarify something. This is so stupid, but it's true. There, in one way of looking at the earth, there's 22 ecological zones from alpine to desert, right? Tropicals in the middle. If you ask anybody, which of the ecological zones is Hawaii? They will say it's tropical. You're not a speck of tropical in Hawaii. It's subtropical. And when you go to the subtropical forest, which they call a tropical forest, it's a midget forest. But if you go in there, you're not coming out because there's no ground. It's just jagged, rough, uh, what do they call it? The popcorn lava. So if you slip and you fall, you're going to get a thousand cuts on you. You could, you could kill yourself easily. I've been in that forest. I've gone back in there and we tried to make trails so that we could go back in as far as we could just to see what it was like. Super dangerous, but all the others are there. And literally, I could take you, I, I, I take people on tours, like I became a famous tour guide for people like uh, Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead and UB40 and Ken Wilber and all those people. They don't, everybody say, you got to see Dr. Gabriel. Why, is he Hawaiian? No, <laughs> but he can show you the places because I literally risk my life every day for about a year going to these places again and again. And I couldn't even get people to go with me, but that's, you know, I, I had to see these places and it didn't matter to me if, if it killed me. It really didn't at that point. Cause I was so depressed. They'd taken away my class from me and that I was kicked out of being Mr. Waldorf. And so I just wanted to go to my ultimate limit, which I'll tell you about a few of those in a second. Yeah. And keep in mind what he's talking about it's very, very real 
in that if you go into a forest or, or like the uh, subtropical, especially, it, it, they have a, it's what's called sometimes a, a false floor because really there's, there's no ground under you. It's just tangles of roots and, and fallen down trees. Likewise, like you're in the Rocky Mountains and you're walking through the forest, oh, isn't this wonderful? You could disappear, just fall right through because what do you got? 40,000 years worth of dead trees stacked one on top of each other and you just fall down into nowhere land. That's exactly right. That's exactly what it was. Uh, and um, well, let me tell you, I was obsessed with the volcano. So I tried to get people to go with me to show me the, the furthest road I could go on up to the active volcano. I was going to walk up and look in it, which is a $5,000 fine. And there's helicopters flying above you, taking tourists for views, and they will turn you in and then the rangers will come out and get you. So a lot of these things were completely illegal. So don't even try this, okay? But I went right up to the end of the road and got some people to go with me. And I carried a big staff with me because I knew this was going to be very, very dangerous. And so we walked up towards Pu'u'u'u. And as you're walking, each time you put your feet on the, on the lava, the black lava, it'll crack like a plate. And you don't know if you're going to fall all the way through to active magma every single footstep. It's not an exaggeration. So we're going on this. And, and, and the, I, I got a whole crew of people to go with me, a couple truckloads of people. By the end, it was me and two boys. <laughs> and we're going up and we are we get to a skylight a skylight is a lava tube coming down from where it's coming up out there you know the, the top part and then it comes down and then sometimes it collapses and you can look into flowing river of magma right so we get right up there and then everyone else is like oh that's it we're done we're going home get it and so they will go back and all, all three of us have sticks and each time we almost fell in over and over again. Those sticks saved our lives again. And so we get to this one and I look in it and they won't get near me. The guys are behind me. The two boys behind me won't get near. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I'm throwing stuff in and watching. Take a big lava chunk, throw it in. It vaporizes before it hits the magma. <laughs> vaporizes. That's how hot it is. It's white hot. So I'm looking in this thing and the river of magma is flowing along. And then it goes uphill. And then it comes into a lake and the, the skylight lets you see into the lake. And I'm looking into the lake and white flames of this stuff is dancing and all these things are dancing all around. I'm like, oh my God, I get totally hypnotized. And then I believe, I believe I saw the triple goddess. It was a three goddesses sitting on three different thrones, three different things. I describe it in my book, Goddess Meditations. But at that point, I didn't really exactly know who that was i'd studied all this stuff i you know but I, I didn't imagine that there could be a being and then she spoke to me and said all this stuff and then told me all this stuff and you blah 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 and basically told me a bunch of my future and all this i'm like and i just keep you know looking in looking in and then eventually when i pull away and i'm completely overwhelmed by this vision and i say to the boys come here come here look in here they won't because you burn your face off looking in there they said, you know, your, you know, your beard, your mustache, your hair is all burnt up. You know that, don't you? And I went, <laughs> no, but I can smell it. I, went, I don't care. What I just saw was so amazingly profound. And then we went further right up to Pu'u'u'u and looked in, which is insane. Not even the volcanologists do that. Okay. But we did. So I would do stuff like that. And we also went down into the lava tubes and I took my friends down there. Matter of fact, uh, I told you his name, Paul Mitchell. He owned a piece of land that there was a hole in the ground. And when you went down, you went down into lava tubes. And they went for miles and miles, many layers of lava tubes. So you had to be very careful as you went from layer to layer. You could fall and die. Okay. Uh, that's that's Paul Mitchell, the hair product guy. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who became a friend of mine uh, because um, I'm the one who told him this thing was on his property. For some reason, it was strange. This place is like... Here's his big, beautiful house, and it's not, it is on his land, but just barely on his land. And it's behind, like, what they call a wiki wiki, a 7 Eleven, you know, one of these fast food places. And one day I'm there getting something, and I look at it and I go, Holy crap, look at that. I don't know, the people I'm with didn't see it. I'm going, Come on, we got to go over here. So I go over there and get a machete, and we're 
hacking out and I find this hole. And we go into the hole and it turns into these lava tubes that are the most extensive lava tubes in Hawaii. Well, it's on Paul Mitchell's land. I didn't know who he was. I went to his house and said, look, sir, I want your permission to be able to bring some of the people from the university and stuff here because I was teaching. I eventually uh, ended up teaching the university. Some of the stories I'm telling you bleed through the seven years I was there. But anyway, I became friends with him. He led us and then they had to put because um, there was another entrance to this thing and the women had used it for women who were birthing. And they would go down into this and they'd go to a place they called Pele's vagina, which you could lay inside of. I could I have pictures of me. Brian Lynch took pictures of me lying in this thing and it looks like a female genitalia. But these are formations that happen in the lava tubes, right? Amazing things. So uh, we'd go down there. Eventually they had to lock it up because so many people found out about it and, they, and he'd give me the key and I'd uh, be able to go down there. But we then found that it collapsed at one place after going miles in this lava tube. So I went out and went around and searched for another entrance and saw the energy coming out of the hole of this other entrance. We went down there and we found what became one of the largest historic sites and one of the largest historic finds in Hawaiian history. But to do so, was the most difficult spelunking I've ever had to do in my life. You had to crawl a hundred yards through a thing that's only big enough for your body. You had to lay flat and scoot one inch at a time for a hundred yards. And on the way, you'd see bones, skulls, femur bones, 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 bones. You're going, this is getting weirder by the minute. Okay, so we see the bones and we're going, okay, we're on to something here. So we, we're we here and we're all in this thing. We're going, are we going on? Are we not going on? What, you know, uh, what do you think is happening here? And I get the psychic impression. I'm going, oh, the curse. This is it. We're going towards one of the lava tombs. And uh, these people tried to take bones and they left them on the way out because they were being haunted. They were being chased by spirits. And I could see this. And the spirits are saying, don't do this. <laughs> you know, they're, they're saying this to me. And I'm going, okay, I'm not going to do it. You don't ever take a rock from Hawaii. Go ahead, look it up on the internet. Rocks from Hawaii. You will hear, see thousands of stories of people who picked up a lava rock thinking it's so cute, take it back and they're cursed until the time that they mail it back. And who tells them to mail it back? Pele appears to them, the god of the volcano, goddess of the volcano, appears to them and says, send back my stones. But anyway, we find, we go there, we get out of this long thing, and there's all these things you have to do that are horrifying that most people won't do, go through the narrow things that are so sharp, they'll cut you and blah, 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 and da, 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 da. So finally we're going on, we can't find the burial ground. We can't find the burial too. We can't find, can't find it. So I sit down and start meditating. And I go, okay, it's right there. And my friends start climbing up there and they're going, nothing's here. And I'm going, no, it's right there. No, no, it's not here. Yes, it is. So I get up and I go there and I can't find it. And I'm going, no, I'm sure it's here. And they had cra so craftily hid it that you could be looking right at it and not see it. And then when you stick your head around the corner, which you could barely fit around, I don't know how many bodies were in there. I don't remember what the count was, but it was stuffed. It was a big round opening stuffed full of bodies. Bones, of course. So we told the university, but uh, nobody was brave enough to go that far in to take a look. So uh, we went in, took some pictures and blah, blah, blah. So we were constantly doing stuff like that, finding weird things uh, and having these encounters. Now, Pele, the story is, I haven't even got started on my stories and we're almost done. Pele uh, appears as a beautiful young woman standing by the highway or as an old woman walking along the highway with a dog. And this happens to many, many people. So the steam vents right by the highway where people would go and climb up a ladder, go down, and the steam coming out from the volcano would come to these vents and they do saunas in there, right? Yeah, well, people died in there because if Pele belched, they'd get cooked. But right there, multiple times, I would see Pele. And this, I'd stop my car as soon as I could because they say, never, ever go by her. Give her a ride if she wants a ride. Don't talk to her. <laughs> and you, you hear these stories, you think these people are crazy. I go back. Every time I went back, she wasn't there. It was so strange. So I had this, you know, ongoing relationship. But what was most interesting is within the first days of me being in Hawaii, 
I look on a bulletin board and I see there, there's Wood Valley Temple, Buddhist Temple. So I go there. And the Nechung Rinpoche, the most clairvoyant Tibetan Buddhist in the world, the one who determines who the next child is, who the reincarnation is, the Nechung Rinpoche is the most clairvoyant of all of them. And he goes and he can tell you who the where to find the next Dalai Lama, where to find the next Panchen Lama, the next Karmapa. And he worked for all the different, uh, all four or five branches of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And he was super clairvoyant. He lived at Wood Valley Temple. So I went to Wood Valley Temple to meet him, right? And I get there, the two people who tend him, Michael and uh, Maria, say, oh, I'm sorry, but I think he's passing into the spiritual world. He's been in a deep meditation for two days. We, we can't wake him. He seems to be passing and there's colors arising from his body and this kind of, you know, like the rainbow ball. I'm going, what? <laughs> the Panchen Lama is dying right here in the room next to me. Okay, so I sat there for a few days and he did die. And I'd never got to meet him. Same thing happened with Adam Biddleston. Same thing happened with Krishnamurti. Say, I go there, they die. Or they were dying at that time. So. That's quite uh -oh. a claim to fame. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Don't have me come visit you. <laughs> Some information about the Gospel of Sophia. The opening scene is going to see Pele. Now, this is really Douglas's story, but I wrote this in a way that if you pay attention, there are no pronouns used. It could be a he or a she that's going through this adventure because Douglas's adventure in Hawaii was more in the 3D world as a form of spiritual initiation and journeying, whereas others of us went through the volcano experience, the fire experience, um, more in the spiritual way. But either case, we all have to make this journey to truth. So anyway, only those on the inside will know that. And you've been there and you had your experience with Pele, which is very similar. And so you can get this in two different versions. But the point is, is in the Gospel of mm -hmm. Sophia, if you want to read about this, it's the first story. It's what it's it opens with. It's the first with. story, but I wanted folks to pay attention. There are no pronouns in there. It can be he or she or any of us. It's all of our journeys. Yes, John. And you have to keep in mind, if you get into studying different traditions, all genuine traditions have the same core uh of principles involved. And so you look at this, you go, well, well, what's with this Pele thing and all the fire and all that? Well, if you get into understanding uh, Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science or these other traditions like the Hopi, that the earth is the fourth planetary condition, but the very first planetary condition was a condition of warmth. And so there's a certain primacy of that fire element that, that is very, very important to understand in terms of uh, initiation. Right. We're all going to be going through that. A lot of us are going through this fire initiation right here on Earth right now as our empire collapses. But you can internalize it and see this is a journey. You're going to have another lifetime. You're reincarnated. Uh, and another thing is people will ask as you're doing these Waldorf stories, they want to know, well, I've, you know, I'm 60 something years old. I didn't have this experience. I wish I could. Well, then do it for yourself. Go and use the Waldorf curriculum or the glass bead game. Follow the path and you use your consciousness as or your heart as a compass. And you will find the next things that you need to learn in this uh, landscape that's in the Internet. This is how you prepare yourself for the next lifetime. John, perhaps you could speak on that, that maybe we don't take our physical bodies, thank goodness, but we take capacities with us into the next lifetime. Yeah. Uh, one way uh, to look at this, for example, you have the old stories of Mother Goose, okay? And Mother Goose is, you go, oh, that's nice. That's like children's fairy tales and all that. <laughs> well, Mother Goose is, is tied into a very significant individual who was considered the, the Goosefoot queen. And you get into the relationship to Cherubert von Lau on the incarnation of Christian Rosenkreutz and this whole tradition so that there's encoded in your myths and legends and fairy tales uh, this path of initiation. So if you can at least avail yourself of some of these 
myth, legends, and fairy tales, that will uh, empower you so that if not in this incarnation, maybe you're starting a little late, that you'll have a greater capacity to be able to penetrate these mm -hmm. mysteries in future incarnations. So it's never too late. No. And, and, and if you're reading the first chapter of the Gospel of Sophia, read it as though you were having that experience. Internalize that. Know what that feels like to be so close to the fire that you can feel the hairs on your, oh, you know, body cringing and singeing. This is an experience we will walk. We have to walk through the fire to get to the other side. You can do it literally like Douglas did, or you might do it spiritually like John and I have. And when I was there, there was uh, at the Wood Valley Temple when Nathan Rinpoche was dying, he had said a few weeks before to his followers, I'm going to ask the head of the Sakya tradition, the king and the queen, and the head Rinpoche, Dudikin Rinpoche, and the Tolku of Vajrayogini to come here to Hawaii to do the highest yoga tantra initiation, the one that there's nothing higher than any of them than this, and it's never done, hadn't been done in America. And when they said, well, why are you going to do this? He says, because it's going to draw to us the person that uh, I, I need to communicate with. Well, uh, that few weeks later, after he died, they had already scheduled this. So I joined uh, this, and um, Ludin Kinrinpoche gave the full Vajrayogini. Now, she is a naked woman dancing in flames. Pele is sometimes seen as a naked woman dancing in flames. And so it isn't an accident that the most clairvoyant of all Tibetan Buddhists came to Wood Valley Temple, gave the highest yoga initiation, and how many people showed up? Twelve. In the whole world, these monks wait for multiple lives to get this initiation, and it's the highest initiation you get. They, matter of fact, they make a promise. If you continue to do this prayer, it's a simple mantra, once a day, you will reach enlightenment in this incarnation or in the next incarnation. And if you've had the initiation in this time, then you will be given the initiation for guarantee in the next time. So they believed that the people who came, the 12 people who came to this initiation at Wood Valley Temple on the Big Island were somehow connected with the new nature of Rinpoche. And we never figured that out, uh, how that all uh, was connected, but now the nature in Rinpoche is living there, uh, and he's a young boy. He was found. Well, Douglas, we have passed our hour mark, and I know you could talk for the next three hours. Can you kind of wrap this up? I know that. Oh, I can good. feel the second wind coming, and then we'll have. I just John put my sunscreen out. on, and I've had it out is, to the beach. This is the, the bow on the ribbon. I, John, <laughs> well, where are we going next week? Where are we going? Okay, so we're right in the thick of Douglas. Uh, uh, Lama Lama Dorje, we'll call him. <laughs> and uh, but this is a, such a fascinating journey, and of course we're going to return to continue on this adventure next week. And I want to thank everybody for showing up, and thank you to Lady Tyla for for making all this possible, and and of course Doctor Douglas Gabriel for allowing his hair to stand on end, and eventually his eyebrows grew back. And so we'll see you all in the next episode. There she is. Yeah. And just let me say, if you want to read the opening chapter without uh, purchasing the book or downloading the whole book, we called it the vision of the triple goddess. And it is on our site, gospelofsophia.com. So jump in, enjoy the fire, and we'll see you next Ancient, week. Ancient, boiling cauldrons of life. Create the firm earth beneath us while she vents her plumes of sulfur high into the atmosphere above us. Her roiling oceans of molten rock have thrust up the mighty mountains and have ripped open the expanding floors of the seven seas below us, while her blood-red rivers of magma rush to the surface to birth new land or explode the top of a mountain, leaving only volcanic rubble and dust, or a plume of ash that can reach into outer space and blacken the sky, while being heard by all in her deep rumbling, the whole world round. No one has beheld her fiery beauty in her hallowed halls beneath us, 
No one has known her virgin soul from times immemorial. No one can stand upright on earth without her fiery hold. No one can remember creation without sounding her names of old. No one has seen her triple flaming soul so brilliant and yet subdued. No one has known her secret ways that labyrinth the soul. No one can dance her birthing song so deep and suffering true unless her names she chants again or gathers the spring morning dew. No one can feel the spinning earth or hold the ocean's life. No one can know the Creator God without her selfless strife. No rock or stone or tree or cloud can exist without her grace. For she's the one who made it all, the features of her face. The rays of sun she takes and holds and births the planet whole as she dances the rounds and rhythms long that tumble as we roll. Through space, she claims as Earth's own song harmonies of the spheres that create the time and space we know down through the passing years. She suffers long to bear our weight, both our bodies and souls, patiently awaiting the time when our spirit can hold its own and not depend on her unconsciously, without ever any praise. Uniting again as one earth, till our voices together we raise. To exalt her names, her deeds of old, to know her efforts true, to find the way to unite again, one planet, one spirit, renewed.